Austin says, had a new therapist today whose partner is autistic, so she actually understood me pretty well. Hooray! That is so good to hear. I think just having the lived experience element to therapists is just, just helps massively. All of my experiences that I've had so far in therapy have been with people who just know absolutely like nothing, nothing about autism really from the lived experience perspective. I've had some pretty like bad experiences as well. Usually the times at which I go and actually get therapy is when I'm not doing the best. But when I do go in, I t tended to be like extremely anxious, you know, have a lot of feelings of like, a lot of experiences of like panic attacks and stuff. There's this one, one guy that I went to, I think I had what exactly one session with him and it was about five minutes into it to the point where he would just, I was explaining to him parts of my experiences and he was just basically just ignoring me and telling me like what the autistic experience is and what I need to do. <laughs> like, it's like treating me like a kid basically, infantilizing, very much so. Other times, I mean, it's not the most common experience that I get with therapy, but it's, 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 a it's up there, you know, in probably like the worst experiences that I've had. In terms of general experiences with therapy, probably like the majority of the sessions is just spent like, explaining to the therapist what it is like to be autistic and you know by the time that i explain like who i am and how my brain works and how i think it's like the end of the the sort of therapy sessions that we have which is not the best to be honest that's that's mostly my experience of it i mean i used to actually get it that's another thing like on the general healthcare but nowadays not at all. I think I filed for for therapy for like a severe depressive spell probably like six months ago. Still haven't got back to me about it. Heard nothing. Absolutely nothing. I get that way dealing with doctors in general. Yeah, I mean doctors are just like, you can get some good ones. I know that there is a tendency, you know, if, if people come across me sort of bad mouthing professionals, they'll, they'll think that I, you know, and sort of disrespecting the name, you know, in a sense, and like the the education that's been put into it. I'm not talking about all professionals, but there is a tendency of particularly some some doctors to think extremely highly of themselves and just like same as with that therapist I was talking about, just not listen to you and just shovel advice and things into your brain in, into your ears that you've already tried. And the things that don't work <laughs> that that tends to be the most common experience that i have but uh, there are definitely good ones out there for sure i also want to go to therapy but i'm scared of therapists <laughs> there's there's definitely a barrier like a personal barrier that some people can have when it comes to therapy like if you worry too much about how much the therapist is judging you that can definitely like impact your ability to have like effective therapy I was very much like that when I was younger. I think as well, probably like one of the other barriers that I'd like to highlight would be the like the indirect communication element of it because the thing is therapists, GPs, doctors of any kind, you know, they are, if they're neurotypical, they, they generally factor in indirect communication. Um, and so sometimes some people don't really understand that you know, the the impact of experiences that we have or the impact of our emotions may not be completely apparent on our face or our body language or the way that we speak and present. And that can sometimes be a barrier as well for like people taking us seriously about our experiences. John says I had an intake for a therapist recently, but she kept asking so many questions so fast I couldn't keep up and went home and thought about what I had wanted to stay for like a week. <laughs> you gotta take in like a whole bunch of notes. Like if you experience like social anxiety around people, not saying that you do Jordan, but if you, if you experience social anxiety and you struggle to like speak your mind, I think again, because they're a human being and you can still get those, those feelings even with a therapist, especially if you don't know them very well. That just having some notes, like some talking points that you want to cover before you go, 
I think is quite important. My first assessment with my healthcare provider in 2019 was disastrous in how they misdiagnosed me and guided me the wrong way for years. That is another aspect of therapy as well, isn't it? Especially if they don't know that you're autistic and you don't know. There's a whole host of like different misdiagnoses that you can be pushed through. Which some of them, some of the more common ones, do actually get medicated for, you know, and can make you feel worse and like make the problem manifolds more difficult. That is definitely another another aspect. Rapid fire questions make me shut down. Yeah. I think some sometimes if I'm not in a really bad anxiety state, I can just say you know, you're asking me, you're asking me questions too fast. Could you slow down a little bit for me, please? <laughs> but sometimes, no. Like you just get get it with some people. They just, rap, yeah, as you said, rapid fire. It's completely overloading. Then you feel stupid. You feel like you, you know, you feel like you're coming across as not really knowing what you're talking about. Or the autism sc screen my therapist sent me was very hard to answer. The strongest ability in life is test taking. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, th I think, especially on like forms like that, they can be particularly uh, ambiguous when it comes to like the, the way that they word the questions. It's the same issue that I have with exams. You know, I, d I just think that the the way that they the word them, they're not specific enough. Autism assessment. You know, they said that maximum you you're gonna have to wait for six months. It's not like that. It's like two, three years. Really depends on how lucky you are, to be honest. I think as well, when it comes to the whole trying to find like medication and switching it and changing it on all that, I don't think there's enough research on autism and meds, or at least there isn't enough awareness of autism and medication, like for doctors, GPs, you know, because there's other considerations that you have to make in that case. I tend to talk over them. Good on you. <laughs> this diagnosis is a special interest of mine. It cost my partner the twenties, determined to become an excellent diagnostician. That sounds like a great idea, Stephanie. So we've talked a lot about the therapy aspects. I think the last, the last probably most impactful thing is alexithymia. Like, I actually went to a conference recently, the autism show actually, and I was talking to. People, people at the stand who was d doing some like psychology work. I don't think that they were the psychologists themselves, but you know, it was, I think, particularly geared towards children, autistic children. Might be wrong about that, but they didn't know. They didn't know about alexithymia. Like mad, it's um, has such an impact on therapy. It's actually one of one of the main points in my presentation on alexithymia that I made. You know, I had a lot of questions from parents saying like, you know, well, what can we do for, for my kid? My kid sort of has the same experience and I'm like, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I think probably the, the advice that both me and my, my mom gave was to ask them, like if you think that they're feeling a certain emotion, like ask them how they're feeling. But I mean, a lot of the ways that I sort of navigated around alexithymia was by sort of trying to understand it myself and become more aware of like the bodily thought behavior kind of signs. But that was only early twenties, late teens that I started to do that. You know, when you're talking about kids that age, it's quite difficult. Definitely needs to be a lot more considerations for alexithymia in therapy and such. If I seem distance, it's usually when I'm flooded, 100%. It's that whole faux regulation thing, isn't it? No. You look completely regulated and fine and calm on the outside, but on the inside there is a storm. A storm of anxiety. I suppose that's another point for the old therapy. That's why the lived experience component is so important, because even if the therapist doesn't understand or have an awareness of alexithymia, they do have experiences with autistic people who tend to be alexithymic. 
you know, so, so they have an inherent sort of understanding that sometimes we don't know how we're feeling and sometimes what we're feeling isn't expressed in the same way on the outside, you know.